Okay. Okay, we're recording. Excellent. So what I what I want to begin with is going over the homework. And although Peggy is not with us, or I should say is only with us in spirit, she has contributed her assignment. So I want to start with that. Um, and then we'll do yours. Uh, and then we'll go back to the handout. So let me uh, share screen on her. Now you will remember that the assignment was to do a narrative. Right. Right? Okay. So let's go through this. You can see it. And, uh, and I ask you to use uh, Farajaka. Uh, I'll sing it. <laughs> okay. It's very funny. <laughs> good, good, good. I've been naughty, dear old Santa, but it's not all my fault. There are circumstances. I deserve more chances to get toys that make noise. It's my sister. She's annoying. I'm provoked, pushed, and poked. She gets me in trouble, but she's very subtle. She'll exclaim, I'll get blamed. I put earthworms in her sock drawer and her hat. They went splat. She thinks she's so fancy, primmy, prim and prancy. She deserved what I served. Now you see that, dear old Santa, I'm a miss on your list. Please consider Mr. Wishes of my sister. It's her goal. I get coal. <laughs> Love it. Uh, well, of course, it's delightful. It is. Um, now, most of it, I'll get to what it is, and, and then later we'll get to what it isn't. Um, what it is, is very um, singable, which I think you could tell when I was singing it, that, that it's, it's fairly easy to negotiate. Now, there are a couple of places that are not so easy to negotiate. Um, and what line would you say in the first stanza would be harder to sing than the rest? Um, I don't know. I don't think that the first one is that challenging i mean you know having a word like circumstances is pretty you know risky but it works so yeah yeah it, it works because it fits so well with that melody there are circumstances that's really it's a descending melody circumstances fits very nicely it's the next line that's a little hard to do i deserve more chances I deserve more chances is a little deserve going from deserve to more is not the easiest transition in the mouth. It's not as easy as to get toys that make right, noise, right, right. you know, or, or almost all the other short lines uh, here. But um, second stanza, very, very easy to sing. All of all of it. Uh, she gets me in trouble is much easier to sing than I deserve more chances. And you can hear it that yeah. when we go, I deserve more. You want to you have to slow down to separate the words, whereas she gets me in trouble uh, flows right along. Um, uh, the third the same, stanza. The same time, I just want to say, like in the first stanza, like I, I, I. You know, I applaud Peggy for using the word circumstances. Yes. Because, you know, it's not 
like your simple monosyllabic word. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and the only reason I didn't mention it is that I want to go through the whole thing and just point yeah. out singability. And then I want to go back and look at uh, the word choices and what's expressed. But I, you're getting, you, you're jumping the gun for me, but I agree Sorry. completely. <laughs> no, that's, that's okay. Um, so, you know, it's the nature of the melody of Frere Jacques because many of the lines are just three notes that, um, And her hat, they went splat. She, she deserved what I, very, very well placed. All of it is very natural. Um, it's possible that, that um, uh, in the last one, it's all easy to sing. Now you see that dear old Santa, I'm a miss on your list. Please consider, please consider Mr. That's a little clunky, but not bad. Wishes of my sister. That's very smooth. It's her goal. I get cold. So in other words, with, with just a couple of sort of slightly complicated physical physicality in the singing, this is really, really well matched with the melody. Now let's go back and look at what is said and the word choice. And I agree with you. Um, there are circumstances I deserve more chances, I think is really just in terms of what's expressed. I agree with you completely. In a lyric that relies so heavily on monosyllabic words, to throw in a multisyllabic word here and there really froths it up a little bit. And she's done a really nice job doing that. Um, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the use of um, earthworms is great. That's a word you don't, I, I don't think I've ever heard in a lyric. <laughs> no, I don't think so. And so also, <laughs> also the imagery is very strong. Yeah, well, and that's and again, I want to make another pass and talk about what, what's what's actually said. Um so uh I think she definitely gets high marks for diction in terms of words that she's chosen. Now in the last stanza, of course, Santa is not really a mister. But she's got to rhyme it with sister. Right? Yeah. I mean, where, where do you see mine? <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> anyway. I'm looking forward to it, but one, one at a time. Um, I know. I'm just I'm just laughing because there's a lot of um, similarities in my mind. Okay. So you'll, you'll see. But you've already established that you enjoy uh, the use of irony. And of course, yes, yes. That's used very liberally here. Um, so uh, I'm not sure there's a better choice than Mr. because you've got to have sister. And Wishes of my sister has got an internal rhyme, which is really nice with the ish, with the mm -hmm. is, you know, wishes of my sister. So, um, so she, you know, she really does some very interesting things with sound. Now, if we look at rhyme, um, there are a lot of pure rhymes. So, Circumstances, more chances, toys, noise. Uh, provoked, poked. Trouble and subtle is interesting. It's a half rhyme, but it's the kind of thing that in a short line in a song, the vowel sounds and the ubble, subtle and ubble, is uh, and trouble, 
is kind of a soft consonant sound, just as subtle is not a hard, it's not as hard as it could be. So it works. Yeah, it does work. Um, you know, exclaim and blamed again, <clears throat> because it's the the hell vowel, ex she'll exclaim, I'll get blamed. So then when you throw the D on at the end, you've already established that, you know, the parallel sounds. Um, Diction-wise, uh, rhyming hat and splat is just great. Yeah. For what it is, it's just great. Um, and then I want to jump ahead because I want to come back to the primmy, prim, and prancy line in a, in a bit. Um, a miss and list is a similar thing where the where the 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 vowel sounds, the I sound that that, that kind of soft I sound carries it on the on the held note, and the T at the end, just like the um, just like the what was the other one? Subtle. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it works. Now, the only question I would have, I want to make believe that Peggy is listening. So, Peggy, <laughs> my only question is, you've set up a really interesting um, set links of words in the middle of the third stanza. She thinks she's so fancy, primmy, prim, and prancy. She deserved what I served. <clears throat> now, because primmy is not a word and because you're already using it in the next word, is there a different word that you could put at the beginning of that line that would maintain the meaning, or at least the, the characterization, the attitude of the sister, and try to maintain the connections between fancy, prim, and prancy, because you've got the rhyme of fancy and prancy, you've got the alliteration of prim and prancy. But I'm primmy, it could primmy is not the strongest possible solution there. I mean, could she use the word proper? You could. I mean, that's what it's not a word that kind of flows the way primmy does, but it's it still yes. has the, the consonants and uh, <clears throat> you no. Know, okay, so that. That does give you the alliteration of the PR sounds. It does give you the correct diction for the character of the sister. It does not, um, it doesn't, uh, float by <laughs> yeah yeah it's not as i mean primmy yeah. for all its you know for for all of its approximations has a great sound so can you think of a way to keep the that y ending on primmy and um, substitute a word that will that will do what yours First solution also did. Maybe she could keep primmy and change prim. That's true, except that prim is a real word and primmy is not. I know, but songwriters make up words all the time. That is true. <laughs> so, so no, so this is another option. I mean, what we what I <clears throat> what I've been trying to stress in these sessions is that. You want to be aware of all the options. And then the one that you choose is the one that's most native to you as a lyricist. So different people can make different choices. You know, it's not simply there's a right choice and a wrong choice. It's there's your choice with your sense of the balance of what's gained and what's lost. 
and, and the next person's choice. That's right. That's right. Now, the word that I thought of uh, is frilly. Frilly? Yes. Uh, fancy, frilly, prim, and prancy. So in other words, you're getting the F sound of and the Y sound of fancy with and the FR sound frilly, prim, and prancy. It kind of it kind of walks the line between the two. So it links up fancy and frilly and keeps the prim and prancy together. So that would be another way to go. Um what if what if you took you kept the word primmy? Uh, by the way, I don't have it on my screen in front of me oh, right now. So really? try, yeah, I don't know why it went away. I had it. Let me let me stop the share and share it again. Okay. Because I want you to be able to see it if possible. Okay, good. Wonderful. Thank you. Um yeah. so I mean if you if if Peggy wanted to keep the word primmy and she could put in prissy and then take the word and out. So you're you've still got the that alliter that uh consonants there. What was that? What's the one you had, Prissy? It, yeah, Prissy. If you put primmy, prissy, prancy, which would be really hard to say. <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, you could use prissy where I'm suggesting frilly. Fancy, yeah. prissy, prissy, prim, and prancy. That might be even better. Because now you're keeping the P sounds. All right. So again, uh, Peggy, if you're watching, um, there are three different options, and you're free to look at. Uh, you're free to find more or to choose among the ones that that we've come up with. But the main thing is, I wanted to isolate that that's one word in a lyric where the words are so well placed and apt. You know, you don't want it to fall down anywhere if it's at all possible. So I think that's interesting. I mean, this is good. Now, <clears throat> this is a very, very successful lyric um, expressing the, it's complex too, expressing the relationship between the sisters, building on the tradition of Santa uh, having a list <laughs> of who's naughty and who's nice. Um, I'm a little, a little confused by the final stanza in terms of what's actually being said. How do you read it? When she says, I'm a mist on your list, please consider Mr. Wishes of my sister. What do you think she's asking Santa there? Yeah, I think it's a little, I'm a little confused because um, unless the unless consider means more than just think about, but to, to look at critically, maybe that's what she means. Does that make sense? It does make sense. But yeah. Yeah. my, my first question is I'm a miss on your list. Oh. So my question is which list is it the list of oh. the, the, the naughty list or the nice list? So is she saying, I'm a miss on your list, meaning I shouldn't be on the naughty list or I shouldn't be on the nice list. I assume it would be the naughty list because she's been defending herself oh, right. earlier in the lyric. But then it goes to please consider Mr. Wishes of my sister. It's her goal. Yeah. I get oh, cold. Oh, that's, that's her wish is that she gets coal. I got it. Well, that's the, that's the sister's wish. Right. But what do you think the speaker, where do you think the speaker thinks she, it'd be great if Peggy were here to tell us, but she's not. <laughs> I guess she's saying, you know, read this list, read, you know, just be critical because um, just because my sister's 
my sister wants this, it doesn't mean that it's warranted. I know it's a yeah. little, you know, I think you're right. It's a, I think it's a little bit unclear. Well, it ends with, with, you know, consider my sister's wishes. Her goal is that I get coal. Right. But it doesn't come down on, I mean, you would want to end your plea to Santa since it is entitled a plea to Santa. It seems like you're defending yourself. Um, so, I mean, to me, it would be more like, please consider my wishes, not just my sister's wishes. But maybe there wasn't an easy way to do that. So, so in terms of, I mean, the rest of it is completely consistent in terms of the relationship between the between the sisters. And in, in the opening stanza, uh, the speaker admits, I've been naughty, but it's not all my fault. There are circumstances. And so then it's, you know, then we kind of see that she's defending herself. And then she admits that she did this terrible thing with the earthworms. <laughs> But it was deserved. It was deserved, <laughs> but it, but it was but it was deserved. So anyway, I, I I think it's just, I think it's really a scintillating lyric with a couple of, of of very small things that might not be that easy to fix. Now, having said that, um, it's only very tangentially a narrative, which is what I had asked for. If you remember, I asked for a, a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so um, what we have is the beginning and the middle and the end to the, uh, to the request to Santa. In other words, in that sense, it has the structure, the request as the structure of a narrative, but it doesn't tell a story in any in any direct way. It uses story elements by, in flashback, showing us what the speaker has done to her sister. So it isn't what I asked for, but it's so well done. I, I mean, I don't mind that it's not what I asked for. Uh, I'm, don't, don't you think also that, I think that this melody lends itself to sort of like this ongoing, never ending repetition. And I mean, I felt like um, the ending was hard for mine, to, was, is, was challenging for me too. Um, yes. Just, just because of the whole rhythm of the song and the, the way that it, you know, anyway. Well, yeah, I understand you. And um, that actually was part of my intention was that uh, people would see, because you're exactly right, this particular melody is very simple, and the repetitive elements are very, very prominent. It's not a complex melody. And so when you're doing this difference from the previous exercise in that you're coming, you're using the same melody multiple times. And that's why I asked you to try to go through a narrative because the language that we use to end a story is different in tone from the language that we use to begin a story or to continue a story. And I think you ran up against that when you were trying to use this simple melody that kind of makes it easy for you to start and, and easy for you to continue, but it's not so easy to kind of tie everything together verbally with a melody that's just so simple and so spare. And I kind of was hoping that people would run into that problem because it is a problem uh, anytime you're writing a ballad and you've got lots of, you know, lots of uh, choruses. Um, and I guess it's instructive to go back to, I don't know, one of those songs that goes on for a long time, like Rocky Raccoon, which does have a very, uh, a very clear narrative spine to it, right? We get the, 
we get the setup at the beginning. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think of how it ends. Uh, Rocky oh. Raccoon went back to his room only to find Gideon's Bible. Uh, uh, so, so to, to aid the, the Rocky Revival is to the help. In, yeah, it could help in the Rocky Revival. Yeah, which is actually um, not that conclusive an ending either. I mean, I think even Paul ran into, <laughs> ran into, ran into what you're talking about. Um, I'm trying to think of the other. What about uh, the Ballad of John and Yoko? That's actually journalism. How does that end? Oh. Uh, I mean, aside from the Christ, you know, it ain't easy. You know how hard it can be the way things are going. They're going to crucify me. But I'm trying to think of the last part of the narrative part um, before he goes into the into that the chorus. Uh, and it's eluding me right now. Um, but, you know, the way that I was first exposed to this kind of song, this kind of structure, I think I mentioned was the the camp song about the sinking of the Titanic. And that, of course, has got a built-in ending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that and, still doesn't mean that your song is going to end well. I mean, I, again, I don't mean to be jumping ahead, but since we're on this topic now, I yeah. found that I feel like my mind just ended really abruptly. And I think that that's a challenge with a ballad because you don't, you want to end it, you know, you want to end it when it's the time to end it. So however long that's going to take, but at the same time, you know, it has to be, things have to be tied up and, I don't know. I certainly, I don't know if I did that, but. Well, we'll, we'll see in, 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 in a minute. Yeah. But it is a challenge. And and I just wanted people to be aware of kind of bumping up against that very challenge because you weren't in a position to bump up against that challenge last week. But it does belong to what, to this. Um also, How? last week with America, with um, God Bless America, it was really, you know, it had like a big a beginning, middle, and end. And with this, it could go on forever. Yes, that's right. And again, that's uh, that's the issue of the ballad is that it can go on, and um, and it and it does go on. I mean, you look at you look at some of the long. Dylan songs, um, even the one from his most latest LP, "Murder," when he when he does that song "Murder Most Foul," which is about the Kennedy assassination. I mean, there's like twenty choruses, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> you know, or you know, "Sad I My Heart's in the Highlands." That's um, that's another narrative that goes on and on, and he's he's sitting drawing you know, drawing the waitress's face on the napkin and um, they're having this conversation about whether he reads women authors or not. And um, the thing about Dylan is that um, he often will write songs with very, very many choruses, particularly in the latter part of his career over the last 20 or 30 years, where you could literally um, – scramble the order of the choruses. They're not narrative so much as they're impressionistic. And so you get an impression from each stanza or from each, you know, from each chorus. Um, but they don't build to anything. They establish a mood and then they, it's almost like a theme and variations on, you know, he's got his theme and then he'll, he'll keep coming back. Um, and that's a different kind of a, a different kind of a structure um, in terms of it's, it's not a different musical structure, but it's a different approach to writing a lyric. And I'm not sure that I ever encountered um, before Dylan did it, a writer that did that, that, that could, could abandon narrative over many, many stances and just create separate stances 
that embodied a, a particular mood. You know, uh, um, uh, hell is my wife's hometown is, is, is a good example of that. Every chorus is a, it's, every chorus is a different kind of dire situ, you know, setting. Um, but anyway, there's a lot that you can learn from, from Dylan, but it's hard to do what he did. And uh, after a bit, after we look at yours, since we've got plenty of time, this is time that normally we're really able to go into some detail here because there's so few of us. If when I when I have 10 or 12 people, I have to kind of move through them fast. So why don't we go to yours? Now, do you have um could yes. you send send it to me like uh as a document by email and then oh, I can sure. I, I can share it? Oh sure. I was going to ask that last last week because I was concerned about. Being oh able yeah, well, to well, we can it. try. We can try that. We can start by seeing if you can you can screen okay. share. Let's do that because okay. I'll be interested to see myself. I haven't yet tried that. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, files. So. No. So if it's on my, mm, it's on my. Okay. So you, when you're looking at your screen. Yeah. Down at the bottom, there should be a right. green square right in right. the middle that says share. Right. And I clicked on that. It's the problem is that the, what it's offering me in terms of it's not, or I can't look at my desktop, which is the problem. Okay, well, let me send it to you then. Okay, because what you should, the other thing you have to do is you have to open it. Oh, oh, okay. Let's see if that makes a difference. Oh, that'll make a difference. <laughs> okay. So it's right. Open it and then go back to share, okay. and okay. it should okay. show up as a separate, um, as a separate file among the options. Okay. So where's the. <clears throat> Where's the little green thing? All right. Getting there. Okay. Share screen. Ah, there it is. Got it? There it is. Cool. Excellent. Okay. Let me make it larger so that, because I'm recording this. Um, and then let me just see if I can't scroll, but uh, you okay. can I can. You, okay. You can scroll. Okay, okay. great. Uh, you want to you know, sing it's it? Kind of, it's kind of long. Well, it means more singing for you. <laughs> well, and that's unless really, you unless you want me to do it. Why don't you do it? Since you know, you know the melodies. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right, and I, and I, what I'm going to I'm looking ahead a little bit. And so I would say, be on the lookout for where it's clear that I'm having to di diverge from normal um, word production in song in order to make the words fit. Okay. Oh, I can I can tell you where it's going to happen before we even go through. <laughs> well, well, sure, but <laughs> but I want I want but I want to make it audible. I want us to hear it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. My name's Hamlet, I must gambit, but I can't, such tight pants. Here's my little story, hope it's not too gory. Here we go with the show. My dad's brother and my mother tied the knot out damn spot. Oops, I quoted Mackers, another of Will Slackers, I digress. It's a test. My bad uncle is a skunk. He'll kill again. Can't pretend. See, he killed my father. I forgot to bother. Oh, I'm slow. You should know. That's the trouble. Toil and bubble. Oops, again. With Scotland. I know I'm distracting. That's why I'm not acting to avenge. 
with revenge. My girl's crazy, wears a daisy in her hair. I don't care, just can't stand her sire. Nosy little prior, you'll die too. We all do. My dad's ghosting while I'm coasting. Can't refuse, I owe dues. After all, he's daddy. I must kill the baddie on his throne. Seeds were sown. My girl's brother wants to smother and end me. For you see, I just laid his padre. He's part of a cadre out for blood. My name's Mud. <laughs> Did I mention the attention I give mom? I have some. Big time mommy issues, best get out your tissues. She dies too, what to do? Stab her hubby, mean and grubby. Now I can't take a stand. To be or not to be, Shakespeare's bright as ruby. Wave goodbye as I die. Well, I, I have so long. <laughs> it what? I'm sorry, it's so long. No, why? I, I you covered the whole play. It, it had to be long. <laughs> oh no, my husband's like, you didn't mention Horatio or Fortinbras, and I was like, well, shut up. <laughs> you did mention. Um, no, I know, uh, but you did mention uh, 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 Laertes, and that's pretty good. Um, well, by the way. To be or not to be, Shakespeare's brightest ruby. That's excellent. Oh, thank you. That's really excellent because to be or to be or not to be not always gets the push. But the way you've said it, to be or not to be, it's two that gets yeah. the push. Yeah. And what makes that work is that now you're going to rhyme it with ruby. So that's great. Um, I mean that's that's certainly one of the one of the high points, uh, and, and putting it at the end, of course, is you always like to have a high point at the end. Very very good. Okay, now where where was it a little bit of a of a uh, of a job for me to uh, to sing this? Um, I noticed. When, okay, so in the second stanza, it's, um, I, th I thought it was like a little bit, you were kind of having difficulty when you were reading the line, another of Will's slackers. Yes, because there's, uh, there are too many syllables uh, for the, for the melody notes. It's, oops, I oh, quoted right. my, ba 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 Bum, 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 bum. Yeah, you're right. So you've only got two, two, two syllables, and you're using another, which is three syllables. Yeah, I didn't realize that, so I got to fix that. Yes, but, but that like stood out immediately when you sang it. So yeah, because um, and to go back to what I'm always saying about the time grid, uh, because I tried to sing this in tempo. So if you're going, oops, I quoted Mackers, another of Will Slackers, you got to start another. It's an extra syllable. Right. You have to start it ahead of the beat, which means you got to squeeze it in after the Mackers. Uh, yeah. And and so that's that's what the singer has to do to to make it uh, to make it fit, but it's not a natural way to pronounce the word. Right. Um, with regard to the, you know, to the stress. Now, can you think of another way to say that? Which, by the way, um, <laughs> I, because of the tone of this, I think that Mackers works fine. But, okay. of course, Macbeth has never been called Mackers. Macbeth? Yeah, that's yeah. a nickname for it. By, from whom? Oh, it's... People call it that, like theater people call it that, because you're not supposed to say Macbeth. It's supposed to be bad luck. 
Well, the theater that people that I came up with calls it call it the Scottish play. Yeah, the Scottish. They, they don't. They Mac. don't say Mac. But um, that's interesting because I, I I hadn't heard I had not heard that as an alternate way of not saying it out loud. I've only heard the Scottish play. So, did you ever see the Canadian TV program Slings and Arrows? No. Oh, it's so good. So it's all theater. It's like all about what goes on in the theater and behind the scenes and all the, mm. you know, and it's Canadian. As I said, it's Canadian. And the first year, it's three seasons. The first year they do Hamlet, the second year Macbeth, and the third they do um, King Lear. And mm. um, they do, actually, there's a song that they sing. They write a different theme song for each season. And the one for Macbeth, the title of the song is something like, you know, but, you know, I won't play Mackers. So they actually use the term Mackers in the song. So it, okay. might, it could be a Canadian thing. I don't know. But it's yeah, that's where I got it. <laughs> well, I stand corrected because I had not heard it before. But as I did say, I was inclined to accept it anyway. Yeah. Because the, because your tone overall, yeah, yeah. even if it even if it weren't used by people, we understand what it is. Yeah. You know what it's standing for. So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think it's great that you drop in these famous quotes from other plays and then immediately comment on it as part of the lyric. Okay. It isn't just like a quote, like, you know, as a jazz player, um, I, I take part in the tradition when you're soloing, often we'll, we'll do what we call quotes, <clears throat> which is to say we'll quote in the middle of one song part of the melody of another one. Right, right. And that's what this is, except that you take it one step further because <laughs> you, 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 you put in the, the quote reference and then you comment on it as part <laughs> of it, which I, I, it's, it's very, very clever. <clears throat> now, there, there are definitely a few places where the there are places where the simplicity of the language is dead on, and there are a few places where it's a, a a little off the mark. You're not quite sure. So, for example, I digress. It's a test. I understand. I digress. What is it? What is it? A, how is it a test? Yeah, I mean. I, I wasn't really totally pleased with that, but I feel that, you know, what Hamlet's go go is going through is a test. He's supposed to live up to his, you know, fate and he's not doing it. So that's where I felt that comes in. Yeah. There's not quite enough narrative tissue yeah. to connect. I digress, which is a I, comment I on using the quote and then, and but, but you have it established because he makes quite a few comments about his slowness and why he's slow yeah. and, and what his responsibility is, what he's supposed to do. So um, I do sense the hand of a of a teacher in this lyric who has taught oh. Hamlet. <laughs> I love Hamlet. <laughs> Me too. I, 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 I taught it and love teaching it. Yeah. I, I taught Oh, and I taught Macbeth every year for 25 years and basically memorized the whole play. Now, a lot of it is gone now because it's been 20 years since I did it. Yeah, I know. But, but uh, I literally, I'll, when we're not recording, I'll tell you a story that I think you'll, you are particularly equipped to appreciate okay. about that. But let's go back to the top and keep. keep okay. 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 Um, so I think Gambit works, but just barely. I agree. You know, you're, you're establishing right away that you're playing with language. Um, but boy, it, we're, we're hit with it right away. Um, <laughs> such tight hands. <laughs> well, you know, he's always <laughs> looking for excuses. <laughs> So yeah, that, you know, he can't think. He can't. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. But again, there really isn't any contextual tissue to get us to 
to get us quite that far into his character this early. Yeah, but, but you know, you you've got to you got to do what you got to do. Um, second stance, I think it's great. Tied the knot out, damn spot. Oops, I quoted that. that that's just <laughs> that's great. We've talked about it's a test. I'm not quite sure about that. Right, I agree. Um, but maybe there's a way. Uh, you know, maybe there's a way to fix that line. I mean, you've only got three syllables, but maybe, uh, you know, uh, please go back up to the top again. Yeah, he has not referred to his the te his test, his responsibility up up to this point. I mean, we, we've gotten some introductory information, but you could have here's my test. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Making it more directed at him. Yeah, more directed because right, right then you go right into my bad uncle is a skunk. He'll kill again. Can't pretend. I mean, this is his dilemma. It, 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 Right. This right. is the substance of the test. That By the way, sense. yeah, um, um, uncle and skunk heel, that's really clever. You know, is the skunk heel kill again, can't pretend. That's really, you're really doing a lot um, given that it's such a simple, repetitive melody of three notes to displace syntactically because you know when we're writing poems or when we're most of the time and when we're writing lyrics most of the time we're also writing sentences and you know we're also trying to make a a, a comprehensible statement and poets are always running up against the tension between the line endings and uh the continuation into the next line of an idea that does not conclude. Um, so line endings in, in formal poems that all end sentences neatly are not interesting. There's no tension. You've got to have, you've got to move beyond the line ended in the next line. And then you, you normally will end the sentence in the middle of a line. Sometimes it's after the first foot and sometimes it's on the fourth foot. And so you just have a little end sticking out. But the way that you've done this with just three, essentially three, three segments, I think is really strong. I, I, I like it a lot. Um, and, and then see, he killed my father. That's see is, is, a, is what we call a placeholder. Yeah. It's, you've got to note, You've got to have a word. You can't in chess. There's a there's a term for a move that you make uh, because you have to make a move in order to set up the move you want to make later. In German, it's called Zugzwang, which mm -hmm. means forced to move. Oh, that's so. Great. Yeah. So this is it. It's it's C. He killed my father. You haven't really added anything except a little bit of a little bit of character color there, but it really works because it establishes the tone. It continues the tone. Uh, <laughs> I forgot to bother. Oh, I'm slow. You should know. That's the trouble. Toil again. Um, it, toil and bubble. You've done this really nice reversal here. That's the trouble, toil and bubble, because of course, toil and trouble is the Macbeth line. But again, you've, you know, so much of what we're doing, it's like being a, it's like being a pitcher in baseball. The 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 classic um, sentence that boils down what's going on between the pitcher and the hitter is hitting is timing. Pitching is upsetting timing. In other words, you're trying to get a person looking for one thing and give them another. And that's what you that's what you're doing here in this really, really elegantly simple way, because it's just a handful of words. 
but it, that's really that's really well done. Um, and then, of course, you know, going to Oops is endearing, and that's another placeholder. But it it carries on, you know, our growing uh, uh, acceptance of the kind of goofiness of the of the narrator. <laughs> Oops again with Scotland. <laughs> Uh, now, um, that's the trouble talking about loops again with Scotland. That's I'm not sorry. so strong. I know. <laughs> it was it was a, a choice that I made because I wanted to get Scotland in there, you know. So, but I, I did have trouble there myself. So I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I don't know if there's a better choice. And this is another one of the lessons is that depending on what you're trying to do, you're trying to accomplish a number of things all at once with your words. So you're carrying the meaning, you're carrying the rhythm, you're trying to fit a melody. Um, and sometimes the best of your options is still not all that great, sure. but it's the best of your options. And so then you have to decide whether you want to back up and overhaul that whole corner of the lyric in order to get, say, something different, but that you can say in a more, uh, in a more regular and elegant manner to avoid this kind of um, bump. It is a bump in the road for a singer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know I'm distracting. That's why I'm not acting to avenge with revenge. Again, again it's clever because, of course, he is acting. <laughs> but yeah. he's not acting to avenge. Uh, well, to avenge with revenge. I mean, the real sense here is I'm not acting to avenge in a timely manner. So there may not be an end rhyme yeah. well i welcome you to find one for me <laughs> <laughs> well i guess uh, you know because the preposition links avenge and revenge maybe you'd be better off using a conjunction and saying to avenge to avenge or revenge oh. because you know what i mean because that, then the, yeah that makes more sense it makes more sense, but it's, it's, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, it's repetitive, <laughs> but maybe, maybe it's a little less. Because um, what you don't want is for the listener to stop and think about what was just being said. Yeah. I mean, again, everything that you're pointing out are things that I was like troubled by too. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, what, what, what I'm beginning to understand in, in, in working with you and the others is that um, you're catching on very fast as to what the, what the problems are, what the challenges are, which is good because that means we can move directly to the next stage, which is how do you, how do you attack them? And as I said, uh, in a kind of situation like with Scott Land, uh, maybe what you do is go back and clear out that part of the of the right. chorus and say something different. That's what I was just going to say, that maybe that whole thing has to go. Maybe. So, um, I wrote a little. Uh, well, the other thing about, about that is that as, as we go on in our lives as writers, uh, hopefully... I mean, this is a kind of writing maybe that that you're you're not as experienced in as other kinds of writing, but somewhere along the line, you probably learned with other kinds of writing that our youthful romance with things that we came up with because we came up with them has to be gotten over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't care about that anymore. <laughs> I don't either, but I mean, when I was <laughs> when I was fifteen, I would have said, "I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to take that out." I know, I know. <laughs> that's that's the whole meaning right there. <laughs> right, exactly. That's, that's why I said it so plainly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, this is this is human nature. So, right. Um, the next one's great. 
my girl's crazy, wears a daisy in her hair. I don't care. Just can't stand her sire. I think that work sire uh, is even when we try to make sire a single syllable, the turn into the R sound makes it feel like two syllables. Yeah. So I think that works. Now, uh, and nosy little prior, uh, I think that's great. I don't know that you spell prior that way when it's to pry with a Y. I don't know. I don't know either. Sorry. I should have looked it up. Well, um, but you know what I mean. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the point is, I'm always going to emphasize how things sound. And it's not a problem. We know we know what you mean when we hear it. He'll die too. We all do. It's quite droll. <laughs> Very good. Well, you know, the thing is about the word sire is I just did not want to keep saying brother, father, you know, I didn't want to keep using the same words over and over again. So I was looking mm -hmm. for other words to, you know. Well, one of the one of the pregnant rhyme words that, that you could have thought about is pater. I used that later. Oh, that was that rhymes. <laughs> See? See? <laughs> oh, pater. No, I used padre. No, pa I thought of pater, but I just couldn't really. That was another like rhyming thing that. But there are quite a lot of rhymes for pater. Yeah, that's true. I did think of that. Yeah, I mean, just it just and and that's comfortably within the landscape of tone that this character yeah, uses. That's true. That's true. I was a little bit worried so, about that too, that it wouldn't sound too Latin or something. <laughs> you know? Well, actually, I think Latin uh, for him is a little more defensible than Padre because he's not very Mediterranean. True. That's true. <laughs> but but we'll get to that. Um, I think the next one begins great. My dad's coasting, go, ghosting while I'm coasting. That's just great. <laughs> Can't refuse I owe dues. After all, he's daddy. I must kill the baddie on his throne. Seeds were solid. I think that's O-N-E you want for throne. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I know how to spell that word. <laughs> I know you do. I, I was trying. And, and so I thought, well, maybe she means it. But then how? No, no, no. Uh, so, you know, just so you know, when I write these things, I use my phone. Like I write in notes on my phone. OK. So the type is so tiny. And then I just I put it into a word, uh, you know. Um, OK. But just so you know. It it's, is, it's, it's picking up homonyms and you're not noticing it in the text. Yeah, that, that's what it is. So. Yeah. All right. I no, I, I mean, these are. Out. That's not important. It's my attitude towards error is that errors are only noteworthy in proportion to the effort required to fix them. So in other words, an error like like which is just a slip of the finger right, or right, right. in this case, it's, you know. Yeah. Don't worry about it. There are other errors that are worth thinking about, but this isn't one of them. <laughs> well, you know, I was straight A's in spelling, so I always take it personally. <laughs> yeah, but 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 your 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 phone was not. <laughs> right, right, right. Plus, that was before I got old. Okay, so anyway. Well, but it's it was the phone's fault. That's right. Um, Thank you. My girl's brother wants to smother Anne and me for you see. I just slayed his padre. He's part of a, actually, I always said cadre and padre. So it's kind of a slant rhyme. Uh, he's part of a cadre out for blood. My name's Mud. Um, I mean, it kind of works, but besides Laertes, who wants to kill him? Who would be part of this cadre? You have to get that granular. <laughs> well, here's why I ask because I suggested that Pater might be better than Padre. Yeah, no, and maybe that's true. so. Maybe there's a way to solve two small problems. Yes, 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 yes. Together, I will work on that. Yeah, I mean, it's just I, I don't know that there's an answer because it's yeah. all you know, it's coming to me on the fly. But that's. 
that's a good example of what I of what I said earlier that sometimes you want to back up and and see if you can just take out a couple of lines and replace them with something different. Because all you need, I mean, in this structure, you just need one rhyme. Right. So um <laughs> the next <laughs> the next next chorus is just great. Did I mention the intention I give mom? I have some big time mommy issues. Best get out your tissues. She dies too. What to do? I mean, that's, I think that's great. Thank you. I mean, you know, um, <laughs> you jig, you amble, and you lisp. <laughs> <laughs> well, after you, well, I'll tell you after we finish this. Uh, okay. I have a yeah. Because we're right at the end here. Stab her hubby, mean and grubby. Now I can take a stand. And then the ending, as I said, is really strong. To be or not to be. Shakespeare's brightest ruby. Wave goodbye as I die. I, that's, you know. Now, um, this really does stick to the narrative <laughs> assignment. Thanks. I mean, it really does. It's got a beginning, a very long middle and a very clear declarative end. So, you know, well, well done. Thank you. Um, you know, it's a few things, a few little things that you might go back and think about. But, um, you know, these are, these are all trial runs because, of course, these melodies have already been used by others. Um, and unless you're doing, and I'll get to this in a bit when we get to the uh, to the handout, um, there is, if you're a weird Al, you know, you're you're intentionally because you're creating parody using the same melody and trying to stick as close to it as you can while subverting the original meanings. Um, so, uh, the Prairie Jaca, of course, is pretty much public domain, but, um, but down the road, you know, you're going to be dealing with melodies that are not done by any, used by anyone else. And so this is all designed to sharpen up the tools so that you can deal with it. So that's excellent. Let's, um, if you will stop sharing. Okay. I think that's it, right? Yes, very good. Now, um, um, ordinarily I would say take a break, but I think we're moving along. Let's just keep going and, okay. you know, and it may end up that we'll, that we'll end a little early. I don't have Clint's <coughs> homework. I invited him to send it. So Clint, if you're watching, send it along and I'll write back to you about it. But it was good that we had a chance to, to look at two. I mean, there's a lot of good work in both of these. Um, let me go to my, my handout. And I think this is instructive. So if you look at, this is our part two, alternate lyrics. And um, the first example is a really fascinating example I would submit to you. So you're going to know Moon River. <clears throat> but what you may not know is that <clears throat> when Johnny Mercer was first given the assignment to write a song in the latter part of his career, um, he wrote, because Broadway and the movies um, had stopped, the market for her individual songs, hit songs that stood alone. By the time, Moon, uh, by the time uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's was 1961, you know, popular music had changed. And he wasn't getting the kind of uh, work that he had been getting before. But what he did still get were commissions for theme songs for movies. 
And so he was invited to write a theme song for breakfast at Tiffany's. <clears throat> and when they told him about the substance of the movie and when he saw it, they said that um, it might be nice if the theme song introduced the character. And so his first uh, version was this lyric on the left, I'm Holly. <clears throat> so I'm Holly like I want to be, like Holly on a tree back home. Just plain Holly with no dolly, no mama, no papa, wherever I roam. And um, for a number of reasons, he went, he did, a, he did a different direction. And instead of writing in Holly in the first person, he wrote about this place, you know, Moon River wider than a mile. But this is an example of the same writer putting two different lyrics to the same melody, which I think is fascinating because Mercer was one of the absolute greatest technicians and was perfectly capable of writing multiple and completely different lyrics to the same melody. And so when I discovered this, I, I thought it was very just very interesting and it's instructive um, because among other things, the diction in I'm Holly is very different from the diction in Moon River because Holly singing as herself is very simple and, and the language is very simple. Uh, like I want to be, like Holly on a tree back home. Just plain Holly with no dolly, no mama, no papa, wherever I roam. Now, I'm not sure what dolly, what no dolly means. And this is not his strongest lyric. But the point I want to make is that the, the diction, the word choice is different there than in Moon River, where uh, it's more impressionistic you know, wider than a mile, I'm crossing you in style someday, old dream maker, you're, you heartbreaker, wherever you're going, I'm going your way. So it personifies the river. Um, and the language is more uh, evocative. It's not as simple. Um, and yet, it's the same melody. So all the talk that I've already passed between teeth, lips, and gums about how the melody suggests the mood, it does. But some melodies can suggest more than one mood. And this is a good example of two different lyrics evoking two different moods um, with the same melody. And it's also an example of a, a very accomplished technician as a lyricist able to find solutions to setting words to that melody that can do things as subtle as changing voice, changing moods, and not disturb the connection between the words and the melody notes. So I think it's very instructive. Now, the next one. This is great. Uh, you may know the man that got away from the 1954 film, A Star is Born, with Judy Garland singing it. Um, so great. Yeah, and that story has been told in movies at least four times that I can think of. But um, uh, this particular one, Ira Gershwin is the lyricist, and he was writing it in the 50s. His collaboration with his brother George, of course, ended when George Gershwin died in 1938, I believe. Um, but he continued to write with some of the best composers going. And in this case, it was Harold Arlen who wrote the music to The Man That Got Away. 
And Ira Gershwin wrote this. I mean, Arlen wrote the melody. And the producers of the movie hedged their bets. And they sent the, the, the melody to at least two different lyricists. One was Ira Gershwin and the other was Johnny Mercer. So, you know the, the solution that Gershwin came up with, the night is bitter, the stars have lost their, their glitter, the winds grow colder, and suddenly you're older. But look at what Mercer wrote. By the way, his lyric was never finished and was not chosen. <laughs> if it had been chosen on the strength of what he submitted, it would have been finished, but it wasn't finished. But it's interesting. I think it's instructive to look at what he wrote. I've seen Sequoia. It's really very pretty. The art of Goya and Rockefeller City. But since I saw you, I can't believe my eyes. Now, the rhyme pattern in the first four lines is different. And what we usually say is that the melody suggests what the rhyme, where the rhymes are going to fall. Um, and that's true. The way Gershwin saw it was to rhyme the first two lines with each other and the next two lines with each other. The way Mercer saw it was to alternate it and do an A, B, A, B, like we would be talking about when scanning and uh, analyzing poetry. So Sequoia and Goya, pretty and city in Rockefeller, Rockefeller City. Um, and so I think that's instructive because it says something about how there's still flexibility. Uh, if you've got a, re a repetitive melody, um, you've got some flexibility in terms of how you distribute rhymes. And this is a perfect example. Now, when you go on, Um, no more is eager call, the writings on the wall, the dreams you dreamed of all gone astray. These two writers see the same rhyme scheme. We see three lines that rhyme and then a short rhyme. Um, now, no more is eager call, the writings on the wall, the dreams you dreamed of all gone astray. That's pretty strong. You're one of them, there are things that comes equipped with wings. It walks, it talks, it sings, and it flies. <laughs> well, if you're going to boil that lyric down into a few words, what, what, what does Mercer say? Oh, she's an angel. Mm hmm Well... Of course, you don't want to say you're an angel because that's cliche. He went pretty far afield, though. <laughs> yeah, I would say. <laughs> um, and this is not one of his strongest solutions. And I think part of that is because, to go back to my opening uh, talk, you remember I talked about how Putting words on a time grid is like the Burma shave thing. You know, you're, you, you've got to be able to follow and digest a phrase at a time and know where you are and look forward to where you're going. The problem with you're one of them, their things that comes equipped with wings. It walks, it talks, it sings, and it flies. And you paused when you were looking at it. You don't know it's an angel after the first line. You don't know, and things, by the way, is one of those gloriously drab words. But we don't know it's an angel after the first line. You don't know it's an angel after the second line. Things that come equipped with wings. Could be a bird. Could be a plane. <laughs> it's not Superman. But <laughs> it walks, it talks, it sings. 
and it flies. You don't really know that he's saying you're an angel until you get to the end of all of that, and that's not effective. Because you got to know, you, you got to know where you are all the time to go from one stone to the next to cross the to you know to cross the the brook. Um, however, he then comes back with some great solutions. So back to the repeating melody: the man that won you has gone off and undone you. That great beginning has seen the final inning. I don't know what happened. It's all a crazy game. Okay. Um, that's pretty good. Look at what Mercer comes up with. I've touched the table that held the declaration and Betty Grable in my imagination. But you're a fable that's hard to realize. I mean, this is pretty clever. Now, the table line, he's, he needs it for Betty Grable. He saves it with, I've touched the table that held the declaration. I don't think anybody has ever written about the table on which the Declaration of Independence was written until the show 1776. <laughs> Which, which which came later. And actually, I don't know the lyrics of that show well enough to know if they even oh, mentioned I know, I know the lyrics to that show verbatim. Well, then you tell me. Do they mention the declaration? <laughs> they mention the declaration. The, the word declaration is used in a song, but they okay. don't the table, though. <laughs> well, and then, but see, then he goes, and Betty Grable in my imagination. I mean, that's yeah, that's great. I've touched Betty Grable in my imagination. That's just great. But for me, what really clinches this is the in, the interior rhyme of you're a fable. He's got table, grable, and fable. But you're a fable that's hard to realize. I, I think that's very good. Um, but overall, it's not a consistent lyric. And then he goes on. I've seen a view or two, but there ain't no view like you. Believe me, baby, I simply can't believe my eyes. Um, so, I mean, it's not Mercer's best work, but it's got some, it's got a few great lines. But um, the Ira Gershwin lyric that got chosen is one of the great lyrics. Um, but I think it's, again, I think it's really instructive to see two different masters trying to solve that melody. Um, and here's yet another one, and, and I'm coming back to Johnny Mercer, because I, I do just love Johnny Mercer. Um, now, The Shadow of Your Smile is an example of one of those songs that he was, he, he, again, they hedged their bets. The people that produced The Sandpiper, which is the film that The Shadow of Your Smile appeared in as the title film of the title song of the film. Um, and the lyricist ended up to be Paul Francis Webster. But again, they were given the melody. I can't remember the French writer that wrote it. Um, I want to know who it is. You do. You, you Help me out. It's great having somebody so knowledgeable. Oh, I love him too. Um, Let's just go and it, it'll come to me. I'll okay. Come. So now, to be honest, I'm not that crazy about the lyrics in the shadow of your smile. Oh. <laughs> it's a little too vague and dreamy, weemy for me, but let's just go through it. The shadow of your smile when you have gone will color all my dreams and light the dawn. Well, how is the shadow going to light? It makes no sense. Uh, look into my eyes, my love, and see all the lovely things you are to me. Our wistful little star was far too high. A teardrop kissed your lips, and so, so did I. It's kind of smarmy. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> now when I remember spring and every little lovely thing, and again, little and lovely are just, those are just counting, you know, running in place, those words. 
I will be remembering the shadow of your smile. Well, the lyric that Mercer did not finish, this is really an interesting lyric, I think. Today I'm in a mood I can't explain. It might be just a sudden summer rain. Today I saw a bird that broke its wing, which isn't in itself a tragic thing. Something, 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 something. We don't know what it was going to be. There was, yet I had the feeling start. I had seen my counterpart and love would come and break my heart once again in spring. So he's really try, trying hard to, and straining a little bit, uh, I had seen my counterpart. Um, uh, but if he could have finished it, I think it would have been a stronger song, maybe, than The Shadow of Your Smile. He's, there's imagery in his version. And the other yes. one, really, there isn't. Well, a teardrop kissed your lips, yeah, that's, but... That's, that's it. <laughs> no, really. That's like the big. That's like the line from the the song that everybody knows. Yeah, uh, I guess that that line makes it. But I mean, what what do you mean? Our star was too high. What does that mean? And by the way, it was, <laughs> it, it's Michelle Legrand. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> I knew that. <laughs> I knew it would come to me. Thank you. As I say, it's that's great. Um, yeah. It's great to have somebody that you know that that knows so much of the same stuff that I made it my business to know, you know, and that'll all come in handy for you. Um, good, good. If, if you continue on, and you know, because you know so many lyrics, that's really important, you know, to know what's been done. Um. And this actually is as far as I intended. No, not quite so far. I wanted to go through the forms. I wanted to get to theme. All right, so we've got time. Actually, as it turns out, we're going to be able to use the time. And then when we stop recording, I have a a, a, a little surprise for you. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, now let's talk about forms. I really only touched on the idea of bars in music because that's, that has to do with music notation. But the bars really, all they really do is just mark off a group of beats. So in a four beat form, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, that's four bars. Um, and there are forms uh, that use as few as eight bars uh, per section or per chorus. In other words, there's eight bars of melody, and then it, it repeats, um, but without changing. So the whole form is just eight bars. And uh, a lot of the earliest blues are what we call eight bar blues, although the the most common blues form is 12 bars. But the eight bar, um, as you can see, just has uh, one rhyme. I'll lay my head on some lonesome railroad line. That's four bars. I'm going to let one of them 1800s pass by this mind of mine. That's another four bars. And that's all it is. It's just two, two lines that take 16 beats, no, 32 beats um, to cover eight bars. Um, there's another, uh, sometimes the eight bar blues has uh, uh, in, internal rhyme. Instead, so one summer day she went away. She's gone and left me. She's gone to stay. So away and stay, uh, in particular. And then the one summer day just kind of doubles it up. Well, now she's gone, but I don't worry. I'm sitting on top of the world. And the structure is um, musically. So the melody is. I'll just do the first one. 
I'm going to lay my head on some lonesome railroad line. I want to let one of them big old 1800s pacify this mind of mine. And that's that's a chorus. And um, there might be three, four, five, six choruses or more. Um, a lot of the old blues guys would tell long narratives with this short form. Um, now, the 12-bar form, which is I've touched on earlier, is the one that has three lines. The first two lines repeat, and the third line rhymes with the first two lines. So uh, it's like eight bars, except that you repeat the first line. Um, uh, and there's actually that lyric that I quoted in maybe the first, might have been the first week or the second week. Uh, Petey Weedstraw, I did more for you, baby, than you understand. I did more for you, baby, than you understand. You can tell by these bullet holes here in my hand. And, um, of course, the blues world is the world that I'm uh, known in. I'm not known in any other world, musical world, besides the blues world. Um, and so I write eight bar blues, I write 12 bar blues. And there are many other related blues forms. Um, and then I write songs that don't follow that structure, but follow other structures some that I make up, some that have been used by, by other people. Um, but, but the eight bar and the 12 bar blues forms are very simple, maybe the most simple of, um, of the forms that, if you can call them popular songs, that they took. Now, most of the popular songs in uh, in the larger culture, in what was essentially white culture in the last century and in the century before that, uh, were, most of those songs were based on the 32-bar form where, with, a, with a bridge, which I'll get to. I mentioned it a little bit, but I'll, I'll get into more detail after, after a bit. Um, but um, the... The blues forms did not um, really make their way into popular music until the, well, there was some in the 20s, but particularly by the swing era, you started getting uh, a lot of a lot of bands, white and black, um, particularly in the big band era, using the blues form. Um, and then it stayed on uh, into the 40s and the 50s. And when rock and roll came in, it borrowed an awful lot of blues forms. So uh, Hound Dog, Elvis's Hound Dog from 1956 is a, is a blues. It's a 12-bar blues. Um, uh, you ain't nothing but a hound dog sneaking around my door. You ain't nothing but a hound dog sneaking around my door. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, it's not seeking around my door. It's uh, uh, may nothing but a hound dog. Crying all the time. Crying all the time. You ain't never caught a rabbit and you ain't no friend of mine. It's a different chorus where it's sneaking around the door. Uh, uh, the rhyme there is, uh, I ain't no fool no more. Um, and uh, so in early rock and roll, coming out of what was called, uh, it was called rhythm and blues, in the white world, for a long time, it was marketed as what was called race music, primarily to a black audience. But then it began to cross over. And of course, in the 50s, when rock and roll hit, then those forms got brought over into, you know, into the, the larger population um, and became, you know, very popular. They're not used very much now in what we would call popular music, but of course, they're still used in blues and in jazz. So, but these are the simple, simple forms. They do lend themselves to narrative, to telling stories, 
because they're they're short stanzas essentially that repeat and you can have a number of them. Uh, most of my songs uh, that are in the 12 bar form have four choruses, occasionally five, very rarely they'll have six. So the challenge is to tell your whole story in a handful of lines. Uh, it's, it's a simple forms are easy to, to get started in. They're hard to distinguish yourself as something special in because so much has been done and there are so many just average lyrics that are out there. Um, anyway, that's, I love the form and it still works for me. And I've got hundreds of songs in that, in that literally in that form. Now, God bless America, which you've actually worked on. That's a 16 bar form. <clears throat> it has a kind of a release because the melody, uh, of the first three lines is not the same as the next three lines. You know, it's uh, uh, through the night with the light from above, from the mountains, to the prairies, to the ocean. That's a different melody. So that's really two eight-bar melodies yoked together. And uh, that was a popular song form, uh, particularly earlier on, like in the 20s, and even before that. But if you look at if you look at the structure of popular songs, say, going back to Stephen Foster, who's in the 19th century, you see examples of all of this. Now, the big, in the gold, what we call the golden, you know, the great American songbook, the golden age of American song, the preponderance of songs are written in 32 bar forms. And not all of them by any means. And I mean, there are hundreds of ones that don't follow this form, but there are many hundreds that do. Um, and basically, if you can look at this lyric, a 32 bar, bar uh, form that we call AABA -A -A, links together four eight bar sections. And there are two different musical statements made. So the two different melodies, the A section is repeated after the first four lines. So the first four lines is, that's the melody of the first part of the song. Then it repeats, same melody. Then you get a different melody, and often the harmony changes, and you enter what is called the bridge. Sometimes it's called the channel. Um, and that takes us somewhere else. And then the last uh, four lines, this song has a tagline at the end, but the, the, the last four lines, you go back to that melody from the beginning. So in other words, there are two melodies. You get an A melody that covers four lines. It's repeated four more lines. The bridge has a different melody, four lines. That's eight bars of a new melody. And then you go back to the original melody for eight more bars. So that's why it's called A, A, B, A. And that makes one chorus. And there are a, a million songs that do this. Um, you probably already know Angel Eyes, right? Sing it. <laughs> <clears throat> I should have warmed up. <clears throat> <clears throat> Try to think that love's not around. Still it's uncomfortably near. My old heart ain't gaining any ground Because my angel eyes, she ain't here Angel eyes, that old devil sent You know it? Oh, yeah. They glow unbearably bright I'll sing it anyway for the others in case they don't. Yeah. 
broken. Need I say that my love's misspent, misspent with angel eyes tonight? So drink up, all of you people. Order anything you see. Have fun, you happy people. The drink and the laughs on me. Pardon me. I guess I got to run. The fact's uncommonly clear. I've got to find who's now the number one. And why my angel eyes, she ain't here. Excuse me while I disappear. And of course, Sinatra did the, the definitive version of that. But so I'm sure you noticed that the drink up all you people is a different melody. It's got a different mood. Uh, the harmony changes. Uh, but the other parts are all the same. And that's the AABA form. And there are, I mean, literally hundreds and hundreds. You know, Gershwin's I Got Rhythm is a, a classic example of a 32 bar song. Um, I mean, I, well, if I started naming them, I could go on forever. <laughs> so I won't. But they're the ones that you hear most of the time if you're listening to a song written between 1930 and 1960. Um, now, uh, as we got further on into the last century and as the musical styles changed, um, there was quite a, a – this had been done earlier by a number of people. I think Gilbert and Sullivan do it. But um, – uh, the use of what we call a verse-chorus structure, which is to say that you've got a verse that sets up the story, and then you've got a chorus, and the chorus is that part of the song that gets repeated after every verse. Usually the title of the song is contained in it. Usually what we call the hook to the song, which is that line that grabs you, that stays with you and keeps it stays in your ear is normally in the chorus. Um, and, uh, and that's, as you can see that that's what happens with this song by Smokey Robinson, which um, I think they recorded about 1965 or so. And um, this is Smokey Robinson at, at his poetic best, which he, he He's using simile to multiple effect here. <clears throat> and yet it's in a, you know, it's, it's in a very accessible conversational way. He isn't straining for, you know, our wistful little star was far too high. He's using everyday things. So, you know, you got to smile so bright. You know, you could have been a candle. I'm holding you so tight. You know, you could have been a handle. The way you swept me off my feet. You know, you could have been a broom. The way you smell so sweet. You know, you could have been some perfume. Well, you could have been anything that you wanted to. And I can tell the way you do the things you do. Oh, baby. And then he repeats the way you do the things you do. I didn't put that on here. Um, and then he goes back after the chorus to that original. It's like you're always going from an A to a B, you know, from an A section to a, the chorus is kind of like a bridge. It takes you someplace, but then you go right back. As pretty as you are, you know, you could have been a flower. Your good looks was a minute. You know, that you could be an hour. Now, that, that's a nice line. <laughs> yeah. The way you stole my heart. You know, you could have been a cool crook. And baby, you're so smart. You know, you could have been a school book. Now, of course, you're so smart you could have been a school book. It's nonsensical. 
but we get it. And it's the kind of thing that the the person who's singing this song, that's kind of the way that, that he thinks, you know? So, um, but this is, but then it goes right back to you go to, you know, it, um, you go to bed, anything that you wanted to, and I could tell the way you do the things you do. And so the song is called The Way You Do the Things You Do, and there it is. The chorus repeats the line, and um, and that's what it does. It, it, it's got three verses, and the chorus is repeated three times. And uh, in the classic Motown tradition, um, there isn't a lot of, uh, they don't stop for an instrumental solo. It takes up any amount of time. The singer is really front and center and, uh, and it's very tight. I think the original of this is probably within three minutes or between three and four minutes. Um, so verse chorus, another very, very frequently used structure. Now, uh, going back to songs that come from the theater, in the theater, there was a convention in the last century, at, at the very least, I'm not sure exactly when it started, to, if you're in a show where there's integrated scenes and songs. So you're going from dialogue to a song. The idea of the verse was a kind of a halfway house to get the audience from a spoken dialogue scene to all of a sudden somebody stops, faces the audience and starts to sing. Now, in, in the early part of the last century, often the verse was spoken. It wasn't even sung, um, but it was declaimed, you know. So uh, uh, if you know a song from the 20s that was recorded by the operatic tenor Jan Pierce, uh, The Bluebird of Happiness, um, it's, a, it's kind of a big operatic kind of melody but it's got this declaimed beginning. So it's like uh, the poet with his pen, the jester at his feet, the, you know, the butcher, the baker, the man on the street, and, and it's talked. And then you get to, he stops talking, declaiming in, again, the talking is done in rhythm and in tempo. So it's halfway to the song. Later on, they would add, um, actually put a melody to the verse that was completely different from the song. So this is a good example from Ira Gershwin. <clears throat> and if you listen to, you probably know the song. Do you know the verse? I do, yeah. Yeah, well, the others may not. Um, but I, this is very interesting, I think. So it's how glad the many millions of Annabelles and Lillians would be to capture me. But you had such persistence, you wore down my resistance. I fell and it was swell. I am your big and brave and handsome Romeo. How I won you, I shall never, never know. It's not that I'm attractive, but oh, my heart grew active when you came into view now they go into the ballad tempo i've got a crush on you sweetie pie all the day and night time hear me sigh and so again ballad tempo holding the holding the vowel sounds but um it's interesting it's in character but it sets up the song and the song cuts a little bit more formally and a little bit more deeply. Uh, it's not used very often in popular song settings, but um, of course, 
um, great American songbook singers often go out of their way to look up the verses to songs that everybody knows the song, but often the verses have been abandoned along the way. And uh, Sinatra was very good at doing that. And he found a lot of great verses that he incorporated into songs. And one of the most amazing things about um, what he did with songs is that there is um, there's a verse I'm trying to think of. It's not over the rainbow. Uh, uh, And once again with you, when our love was new, and each kiss an inspiration. But that was long ago. Now my consolation. Oh, Stardust. Stardust is a famous song, you know, written by Hoagy Carmichael. It's got a verse that a lot of people have not never heard. Sinatra actually made a recording once just of the verse. Um, with a big orchestra, big dramatic treatment, and he he sings this verse. He gets to the end, and he stops. I lost you. Where'd you go? Are you there? Uh-oh. Hang on. Okay, thanks. I paused. I I paused the recording. <laughs> anyway, got that. Uh, I, I'm I'm almost at the end of my spiel. Anyway, um, yeah, I just got tired of it. So <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> um, so actually, I just have a couple of more little things, and then I'll I'll end the the recording and then as i say i've got something just for just for you that i won't subject the others to um but so just to finish up here because i want to stop at the bottom of the page here at theme but let me share the screen again okay so <clears throat> crush on you i was just covering um what we call the hook as I said, that's a memorable line that gets repeated at the end of sections that often tie up the lyric with a statement. And one example I give here is got to get you into my life, which is, you know, that's, again, that's the hook for that song. Um, that's what sticks in your mind. Uh, and then there are tags. And uh, in, in the case of the Smokey Robinson song, that we just uh, touched on, the last line is repeated. Uh, maybe it wasn't the Smokey Robinson song. Angel Eyes, Matt, the Matt Dennis song. Yeah. Uh, excuse me while I disappear. That's that's just like an extra, like a tag. And in God Bless America, they repeat the last. God bless America, my home sweet home. Home, God bless America, my home sweet home. So what's going on there is, the music has not yet concluded. So they repeat the last lyric line to let the music catch up. Um, so that's essentially what I wanted to, uh, to do. And now I will give you the assignment and then, but first let me stop the share. Now, um, let me see. Okay. So here's the assignment. It's an interesting one. And let me, I'm going to open something so you can look at it. I'm going to send you this lyric. Although you, you know, you know the song and you could generate the lyric, but it, this will give you a way to 
look at it while you're working on it. So again, what I want you to do is to generate an alternate lyric. And it's to this song. Oh. Right? It's, one of, it's one of the five songs that always make me cry. Well, it's a great, great song. It really is. Um, and so, you know, in a way, you kind of have to forget what it is in order to write another lyric to it. But um, the point is that in this song, uh, the first stanza here, the first five lines, is one whole section of melody. And then, um, Someday I Wish Upon a Star, that middle section is like the bridge. It's got a different melody. You know, so it's Someday I Wish Upon a Star, Wake Up Where the Clouds Are Far It's It's very different. It's very, all of a sudden, the tempo picks up. You know, there are more words fit into the lines. It's very different. And then when you come to the last uh, stanza, it repeats uh, the first part of the original melody. And then, if happy little bluebirds fly beyond the rainbow, why, oh, why can't I? That's a tag. So um, what I am going to do is to send you, I'll send you this lyric, but I've got it, uh, I've got it arranged on the page so that you can see it identifies the A section, the bridge, the tag. It's it's all laid out for you, okay? And that's what um, that's what I want you to try to go by. Make sense? Yep. You may find that it's difficult to stop thinking about the lyric that you know so well that goes with that melody. And that's part of the assignment, because that's something that you run into as a songwriter. It's a very real thing. And next week, I'll, I'll tell a story of how I was forced to rewrite a lyric of mine 10 years after it had been performed. Um, and I had a hard time. I mean, I'd written the original lyrics myself. So, of course, they were right. Why would I have to write a new set of lyrics? But I'll explain the whole story about why I had to write a new set. It's, it's kind of interesting. So um, I think all of that is pertinent for you viewers at home, <laughs> Peggy and Clint. If, in fact, you're watching in different parts of the world at different times, you can uh, you can participate in your way with what Christine and I have been having fun with. Uh, but what I'm going to do now is stop the recording. <laughs>